I have a question for you men who are listening. Did you chill too much in 2020? I just saw the figures for binge-watching episodic drama. The first months of 2020, it was sky high. It averaged eight hours a day per viewer. Some of you guys are watching even more than that, while some of you are presumably watching less to get that average figure. More than eight hours is an awful lot. I, I hope those of you who are watching less are doing it because you're beginning to realize that you need to be getting ready to protect those people who are investing their time in the binge-watching of these episodic fictional stories. I hope that it's because you're getting ready for what's real, because they are not. So what is coming? What is coming that's real? It's not too hard now to extrapolate because we can see the economic data coming out. Contributions to growth in the GDP falling every week from April 30th to June 4th. They're falling, and they're falling pretty fast. So it means hard times for the second quarter world economy, which means what? There will be fewer jobs and dollars available for Americans. It also means a breakdown in everything we're used to having at our fingertips, like dollars and things to buy. And it also means that we may have to resort to what others have done before us which is rebuilding the economy at the most local level. And this is what we're going to need to be working on and studying and getting ready for. This will need to become a theme, an ongoing project in the lives of all Americans. But you men who are listening, I'm trusting that you will be equipping yourselves to lead the way. And this is just like we've had to do before in the United States. After the War of Independence, for example, a broken economy, a weak economy, after the War of 1812. Now, both recovered really quickly because of the ways that men were able to jump into their, their local villages and build up the economy. Now, after the war between the states, both north and southern cities, northern and southern cities had to really work hard at the local level to begin rebuilding the economy. And it took much longer after that particular war because... There was a lot of devastation, especially in the South, where most of the fighting occurred. Communities did survive. Many of them began to thrive as local agricultural and local manufacturing put jobs and wealth back into the equation of a free market. Now, it doesn't happen overnight. That's why, why it takes foresight, it takes discipline, it takes hard work to make it happen. But it did have to begin locally because there really wasn't an each one of those, in all of those situations, there wasn't a real national economy. It was broken. So where are we today? Analyst Brandon Smith gave this illustration just a few days ago. He said, the economy is already dead. Let me repeat that. The economy is already dead. The pin to the grenade has already been pulled. The majority of Americans simply don't realize it yet. That's his analogy. That's what he's teaching us. That's what he's telling us. Now, let me introduce you to a, a phrase, if you don't know it. It's called left of bang, L-E-F-T-O-F-B-A-N-G, left of bang. And it's a phrase that's used by the Marine Corps in the Marine Corps Combat Hunter Program to try to get their soldiers, and especially their officers, to think in terms of getting ready for crises that can happen in warfare. And Brandon Smith's grenade analogy is pretty vivid. It says that the grenade hasn't yet exploded, but will as soon as whoever is holding it relaxes his grip on the lever. It's going to blow up. And that will be the bang in this particular situation. It hasn't happened yet. We're still to the left of bang. Now let me explain this. If you can imagine a horizontal timeline and time moves from left to right, and the bang is an event that happens at some point on the timeline. And when it does, there's crisis and everyone has to scramble after that to recover from that, to recover their senses, to pick up their weapon or whatever has to happen, regroup, fall back on their training and be, and be able to know what has to happen. Prior to that, it's quiet and people have the opportunity to think and plan of what might happen 
if a an economic grenade might go off, and that's that's where we are today. Yeah, it's it's going to go off. We know it's going to go off. Economists know that. I know that, and you know that. It's going to be pretty rough. But we're still to the left of bang at the point of this recording in this podcast. So what do we do with our time if we find ourselves out of work, quarantined again, or have our lives put on hold by the next wave of riots? You know, that's it still kind of looks like a fairly quiet, peaceful situation at that point. But here we are stuck with, you know, not much to do. What are we going to do? Are we, are we going to be able to invest our time well? These openings in our schedules can no longer be seen as kickback time or vacations, or binge-watch times, but we need to turn them into times of intense training and strengthening and preparation. That's what we need to do. That's what the Marine Corps is trying to get their troops to do before a crisis happens. That's what we need to be doing right now at this point. And you all who are listening, I this whole channel is dedicated to helping equip us for that kind of preparation and for those kinds of crises that may be right down the road from us. We're looking at a long-term economic rebuild, especially after the grenade goes off. But we can get a head start on it right now. So how many men in your community know how to rebuild an economy? You know, once it's, it's really fallen flat and there's no helicopter money coming from the Federal Reserve anymore, no stimulus checks, and it's clear to everybody in your community that the U.S. federal government has no solutions. They're not coming to rescue everybody. What happens then at that point? How many of the men know how to rebuild a community? Well, it's how many Americans even know what a collapse looks like? As a young man, I was able to interview a lot of people who lived through World War I, who lived through the Great Depression, and who lived through World War II, difficult times. I mean, the Great Depression was a very difficult time. And most local communities had to rebuild themselves from the ground up. And there were a lot of people who knew how to do it. There were older men who'd been into the night through parts of the 19th century where there had been collapses. And they were very smart and they were very wise. They knew they knew how to get an agricultural economy to integrate itself at a local level. And it was brilliant. They did well. There were my own grandmother invested a lot of time teaching a lot of the young mothers. She was in her 30s at that time. She taught a lot of the young mothers in her own local community how to get by with almost nothing, how to make clothing out of flour sacks, how to make, uh, you know, that, that harvested pig and his carcass go as far as you could possibly take it. The chickens, the eggs, the, the garden, how to get the very most out of the seeds that you could save at the end of the season for the next season, when to plant them, how to plant them. And they, they had a lot of wisdom in this area. How many men and women in your community know how to do this? And we have to admit, none of us, you know, I'm, I'm an older man now at this point, and I've not been through a crisis like this. I have a lot of studying to do to get my mind around the details of what it would take to begin to rebuild an economy if there wasn't a useful currency, if there, if there wasn't any transportation coming in and out of the out of our county, for example, what would we do? How would we get food to people? Where would it come from? How would it be transported? These are the kinds of things we can be thinking about right now. Um, now, why is it that I say that the rebuild must really begin happening at the local level? And we have to admit and remind each other and remind people in your community who will be looking for another stimulus check There simply cannot be an endless rain of this helicopter money from the Federal Reserve. It can't continue. I mean, if it did, I suppose, you know, they brag about their ability to continue to print it digitally just as much as they want. Just push a button and they get as as many trillions of dollars as they want. Well, yes, of course, technically, they could do that. They can't do it constitutionally, but they can do it technologically. And they could get the money to us somehow. But after the third or the fourth tranches of doing that, what value would that money have? There would be so many dollars in circulation. Would it still hold any value? So what we say we have to rebuild locally. We may even have to have our own form of currency in a local economy. And many local economies did that during the Great Depression. It was called scrip. They, they had a non-U.S. currency 
currency that they developed on their own and circulated that around in the community. So to get ready for all this, there's a lot of learning we have to do, studying. We need to be finding the time to study and think and serve where the needs present themselves. And because we haven't experienced this kind of bankruptcy that others have experienced in history, and the debt, and the unemployment, and the breakdown, America has really never experienced that, even during the Great Depression. The levels at which these things have, have risen are unprecedented. This is unique in American history. So I'll say to you all, even if you're working right now, and you do have a job, Find time to involve yourself in the strengthening of your local economy, however you can do it. We know that we cannot control what's going on internationally. So how do we take disciplined control of what is closest to us? This is what I want to talk, talk about now. We start with our attitudes because these we can control. We can start with our immediate environments, our neighborhoods, and our, our immediate community right around us. And we can start with our time. We do have control over our time. So here is an advice point. Build up your resiliency in every area of life and discipline your mind and discipline your attitude. These things we can do and we can control even if everything else seems to be crumbling and falling down around us, which it is. So don't waste any of your mental bandwidth that you need to be investing in studying these things, studying the Great Depression, studying some of these uh, alternative agricultural methods and transportation methods that you may need to fall back on. Don't waste any mental bandwidth in worry, anxiety, indulgence, or denial. I mean, we just have to just say no to those things and be refocusing our mind and our attention and our study on things that are important. We, ha we have to set aside our favorite episodic dramas and begin studying. Don't indulge bitterness and anger. You can't waste bandwidth on that either. And in fact, those things really hurt you. Bitterness and anger, that's not going to do any good. Yeah, are we angry that um, our leaders have let us down in so many different ways just this year? Yes, but I'm not going to waste any time on that. Don't fall into the trap of denial. That's something also that will waste your time and waste your energy and hurt you internally. And so if the evidence that we're seeing points to hardship, we can't fall back on denial and just say, well, I don't think it's going to happen. Things look pretty good right now. If the evidence points to it, let's get our minds ready for it. That's the point of the left of bang scenario and timeline. If things to the left of disaster point to a potential crisis or disaster coming that could happen, then we do need to get our minds ready for it. We need to get our attitudes ready for it. We need to accept what actually can happen when nations go bankrupt, when employment hits 30% or higher, and it's, it, it is headed for that, and when plagues touch a segment of the population. Yes, it could, could the virus come back, a second wave of the coronavirus? Well, the the epidemiologists are not they're they're not concluded on that at the point we are in the middle of the summer right now in 2020 they're not sure we can't let that surprise us or defeat us if it does happen it is a possibility we have to admit beginning in september and even president trump has alerted us and kind of warned the, the american people here's here's a quote a direct quote from his phrase it, it is a very distinct possibility that it could come back. Are we certain it will? We don't know. I don't know. The best medical scientists aren't sure. Many of the doctors that I have talked to and interviewed do believe it will come back just because they have watched other viruses. They're familiar with how they work and operate, and they think that it will come back in the fall. So if that happened, how would the federal and state authorities handle it? We don't have any idea how they would because th things are so upside down right now, and our leaders are not behaving rationally or morally in how they're responding to the virus or to the economic crisis or to the riots or to the political correctness that's exploding all around them. They're, they're terrified that they're going to lose their seats or that someone will vote against them. Someone will accuse them of being a racist, and then they'll lose their seat. So th they're not responding well or responsibly. They're not thinking clearly. 
they may use that crisis to exploit the situation even more than they have already, to seize even more political power or to confuse voters even more leading up to the election. So one way to stay calm during, during all this, what's going to be happening in, in June, July, August, September, is to plan rationally everything you can plan over which you have some level of control. And here's where we should all begin. We can cultivate the disciplines of gratitude and fortitude in our outlook for what could happen. We, we can't actually plan to have these good attitudes as we move into the future. And in this particular podcast, let me just focus on these two disciplines, and they are personal disciplines, having gratitude, cultivating gratitude, and fortitude. Gratitude is a massively powerful virtue to have in your arsenal of resilience. It's, I can't emphasize just how much. In, in history, those who, were, who could stop and be grateful for the things that they had, even in the face of disaster, were really strong. And they really were able to survive. I, I met and talked with people, uh, some of the officers, the naval officers who were, who were shot down during the Vietnam War and put in the Hanoi Hilton for months and then years. And those who could find gratitude for the little things around them were able to endure and come out of that place with a, with a solid mentality of optimism and clarity of mind. And this is what, you know, we're not, I don't think any of us are going to experience anything as horrific as that. But I just, I know from firsthand experience and speaking to these men and seeing what, what they did and hearing from them firsthand and seeing the results of their good attitudes, they did well. And I want us to do well in this. So whatever plans you have had early in the year, and I have no idea how, how badly they may have been dashed and destroyed. We've got to get a new plan A. And the new plan A is to stand up and lead in our communities. Okay, that's why you've come to this channel. You want to be around others who are thinking this way, understanding that we have to make strong investments in our local communities. Your community needs you and your and the world actually needs you. And when I say the world needs you, it's not meant to be some inspirational, fuzzy platitude. The world really is beginning to crumble. And people like you who have something to offer locally are where, what will help put the civilization back together that's falling apart right now. So you need to get out there in your community, even if it's only online from a local Facebook platform, start being an example you need to be the calm one. You need to be the adult in the room. You need to one who, the one who can lead decisively and carefully and with great wisdom. Teach others to note all the local things that they can be grateful for. And you, you can literally teach people gratitude. You can teach them by your example how to be grateful. This takes deliberation. It takes practice. It takes observation. And then teach others by your example in how to maintain fortitude in tackling community solutions. Don't give up. Start where you see a need. And, and you're going to run into a good old boys club. You're going to run into bureaucracy, even in a small town, uh, that will need to be overcome uh, graciously and carefully and diplomatically. Yep, you can do that. Don't give up. Start where you see a need, like retasking farm priorities in your county. Uh, who's growing what? Why? What's going on with the animals? Are they having to euthanize a lot of the animals? Don't, don't let that happen. Try, try to recover as many animals as possible and figure out ways to save the meat, salt the meat, smoke the meat. Get your farmers to pull together on a conference call and figure out what, what the priorities are. What can be produced for local priority consumption if all the meat pack, packing plants continue to close? or to be overly regulated? What if transportation is disrupted? Disrupted. What can you do? Talk to pharmacies right now, see what they need, and make your state and federal congressmen do what they can to lift the barriers, to waive some of the regulations, to get some of the medications in that, that could really be helpful, no matter what's going to happen the rest of the summer and into the winter. Most officials right now, your congressmen, your senators, your governor, they're pretty stunned. And they have no idea what to do. And so if a voter like you 
comes along with a, an intelligent plan and says, hey, do this and you'll be doing your job. You'll be gaining the gratitude and respect of your constituents. So let's work together on this. I'm with you. Let's, let's try to do this plan right here. You just changed a lose-lose situation into a win-win situation if you can do that. And then talk to your immediate neighbors about their own plans. How have they had to change their plan? Do they have a new plan A? And then what's their plan B? What's their plan C? What's their plan D? Help them with that. Because they may need to be as light on their feet as, well, they will need to be. All of us need to be as light on our feet as possible. The plans we have right now, I've totally changed my plans for the year. I've got a new plan, but I realize I may need to change that to plan B and then plan C and then plan D going into the year. Once everyone gets out of vacation mode and starts building a variety of plans which complement all the other plans, and that's what I'm trying to do with my neighbors in the community. And then when we start working together to implement them, the more optimistic and productive I think we will find ourselves to be in the community. Just working together is really good. Now, you will hear murmuring about when's the government going to get here to rescue us and set up a food bank or something like that. Try to just say, hey, look, we can't depend on that. Let's do what we can on our own, in our own county. That murmuring really should stop, and it actually will stop when people realize the government is not coming to the rescue. And I'm not sure exactly when that'll be. I think that will be in July and August. They'll realize there's just, there's no way they can do it if they're disbanding the police and the National Guard and the Red Cross and everything else that the politically correct people will demand that are dis disbanded, what's going to be left of an in infrastructure? And what's going to be happening to peace and security in the area? Um, things could get really difficult. And if you're in a position to communicate and communicate calm and communicate purpose and communicate plans, that people can fall back on, order and law and order in your community. It's like setting up a neighborhood watch, only a little bit bigger scale. You can do that. What are the needs? Can you step forward and try to meet the needs? And so in closing, let me just say that once you can govern your mind and your attitude, and that's where you start before you can do anything to help in your community, you've got to govern your mind and your attitude. And once you've done that, these disciplines that we've talked about, gratitude and fortitude, will help you get little things done in your house, in your neighborhood, then in your wider community. And people will be inspired by your example to take the same kinds of responsibility and successfully working toward known needs and objectives. They'll see that happening. They'll see that somebody can do that and they'll follow your example. And when they do, don't take the credit just keep this momentum going. What is there to stop you from doing it? Well, the main thing that's there to stop you is your, is your own old habits of wasting your time, laziness. So I close with this quote from Edmund Burke, one of my favorite uh, statesmen from all time, going back to the 1700s from, from, my, from the United Kingdom. He's writing about the man who won't be industrious, who won't, who won't get up and do what he knows he needs to do. Quote, he has nothing to prevent him but too much idleness, which I have observed fills up a man's time much more completely and leaves him less his own master than any sort of employment whatsoever. That's Edmund Burke. So rise up and be industrious. If you like content like this, please consider subscribing. If you know others who would benefit from this material, please share it with them. To connect with us directly, please visit jeffreybotkin.com and send any questions or thoughts that you might have to questions at jeffreybotkin.com.